see that guy running up the road there? Yeah. That's me. I'm currently headed to a remote island in northern Scotland known as the Fair Isle. It has a total population of 55. Yeah, it's pretty small. But anyways, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a sophomore at Willamette University, a young filmmaker, and a very avid knitter. I'm here traveling around to learn more about Fair Isle Knitting. People are very, very interested in Fair Isle Knitting. And it's, it's a style of knitting, but because there's a small place that it emanates from, yeah. people like to have contact with Fair Isle. And if you've never even heard of the Fair Isle and have no idea how to get there, well, let me tell you, it's not that easy. First, I got a ride from a friend. Then I got on a plane. Hello! <laughs> I got off that plane. Can you tell, tell people to subscribe to my channel? Subscribe to Benjamin Burton! Yes! <laughs> Grab the bag. Made a new friend. Bye. Got on another plane. Got off that plane just so I could get on another one. And another one. You guessed it. Another plane. Finally, I was almost there. But I had to hop in the good old Chevrolet legs for a little while. I'm looking for Grootness Port. Am I in the right place? Then I got a little lost. This where the then kind of distracted. Then really lost. Did a little trespassing. Finally. I was just one ferry ride away. Now, I know what you're thinking. I haven't learned a thing about fair out knitting. Don't worry, this isn't about me. It's about the amazing people I met and the things I did along the way. I'm Sinclair. Matty Van Trion. Derek Shaw. Roberto. Pat Thompson. I live in Fair Isle. I live in Fair Isle. Yeah. 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 Ye
The patterns are all consistent with the nature of knitting. We have a long tradition of um, producing textiles. Some of it was used to be rent for vadmil, which is a, a woven textile which is then felted. It was used as part of your rent. There's lots of stories of where it might have come from. There was a Spanish Armada ship that was marooned on the Isle. I think some of the patterns might have come from that. No one's, no one's entirely sure. It's all, but it's always been a, uh, it's always been an income for, for the Isle for a long time. I mean, Fair Isle Knitwear is famous all around the world now. And nowadays, people do knit on the machines, but uh, knitting on Fair Isle machines, as they do now, was only introduced in the 19, late 70s, 80s-ish. But there's not very much, if anything, produced by hand. There's no commercial knitting with needles anymore. The, the garments are produced on a, a hand frame machine, which is still very, very complicated. You have to really concentrate on what you're doing, you know. There's no way I could do it. And it took me approximately four years to kind of, I wouldn't even say mastered, but just to learn the basic skills of making a garment. My name is Anne Sinclair and I live in Fair Isle, a house called Booster, and I'm a historian mainly, but I do a lot with historic textiles. And I've been doing it since I was a small child, actually. My name is Pat Thompson. I moved here in 1975 with my husband, who is from Fair Isle. Um, I work at the school. I've been knitting all of my life. I can't remember learning how to knit. Uh, I started because my mother came from Fair Isle and was a knitter, as were her mother, as were several um, generations before that. Because the family belong here and that's part of the culture of being a little girl, but it was in those days. Well, well I have a, a jumper in my collection that was knitted in about 1919, and you could still wear it. Now, what would you say to someone who kind of views knitting as like a useless hobby or something that is no longer needed due to like technological advances because everything can be machine produced and there can be thousands of them in a time that it take you to produce them by hand or with the hand machine? If somebody came with that kind of question to me, I'd say, wise up. Because there is nothing more satisfying, surely, than to produce your own garment that you've made yourself, or somebody's made for you specifically. Especially when um, everyone can be unique. And surely that's a very nice thing to have, a unique item of clothing in your wardrobe. Have you seen that, that I, I did a pattern for a fisherman's cat? A fisherman's cat? Uh, and we actually sell patterns at ten pounds a time, and we've made over ten thousand pounds doing that. We have people all over the world that are supporting our museum, and they are all wonderful, enthusiastic, um, keen knitters. It's, it's a really exciting group, and, yeah. and it just keeps it all living, you know. And... We also uh, live in what I would consider to be a civilized society in that I don't have to lock my door and I don't have to worry about my grandchildren when they were small walking up the road to the next house. And um, I think, to me, that's civilization. I, the thought of having to live with locks um, seems to me quite bizarre. I'm Derek Shaw, I work on the, uh, the Good Shepherd, um, a deckhand, um, sometimes me. I'm an ornithologist by trade, so that's, why, that's, that's why I learned at university. I've always grown up to be so interested in birds. And the Fair Isle Bird Observatory is, uh, is, is famous worldwide, you know, that's what brought me to that. So I've got the award of the Bird Observatory for 12 years. Almost 10% of all the seabirds breeding uh, in uh, UK breed uh, here, a very famous spot for uh, bird watchers all over Europe, uh, from northern Italy. The is very famous for a number of rare birds that turn up there. One of the biggest seabirds colonies of these islands, and uh, you can see 
many different species all gathering here because uh, it's a safe place for them. They avoid predation, uh, breeding on these cliffs. Atlantic puffins, um, some of the skuas, the big pirate birds that bother the other ones. Um, I saw a giant black-backed gull earlier too with an egg in its mouth. I don't know if it was a puffin egg, but it made me very worried <laughs> about the poor little guy. <laughs> um, and what else have we seen? There's a bunch of terns behind me. I'm not sure if they're common terns or arctic terns. Gulls uh, um, and uh, black guillemots, guillemots, razor uh, bills, uh, ful fulmers. fulmers uh, are uh, some kind of, uh, we can say, albatrosses for uh, the northern uh, hemisphere. Big gannet colonies, gallimots and rainbows, kittiwigs, um, arctic terns, and great skewers, the boxy, and the arctic skewer. Yeah, big numbers of seabirds. But we also have a lot of us on migration. And uh, the most popular is uh, surely is the puffin, Raterculo arquata, in Latin. It's been a goal of mine since I was really little. I had this book about puffins. It's called Night of the Puffling. Anyway, so ever since then, I've loved puffins and I've never seen them. So um, I've seen a couple of them in a couple other places on this trip, but really, really excited to see them again today. I decided to sit down with someone whose knitwear is both known and sold all around the world. Um, I'm Mathie Van Trion. I live in Fair Isle, Scotland. I started because when I moved to Fair Isle, I, used, I trained as an architect and I couldn't do architecture here. And I found the knitting was a very creative process and the patterns attracted me so much. So as soon as I moved in, I joined the cooperative uh, that was at that time running and I started just finishing garments and then I did that for a full year and then I went into learning to use the knitting machine. The process we go through to create an authentic feral garment from start to finish I think begins with living here in the island. For some reason the knitting now belongs to the island as a geographical place rather than to the people that makes it. Um, even though I'm a foreigner and I couldn't be more foreigner. Um, once I was living here and I learned the skills, I became part of the island. And one of the things I realized is that it doesn't matter where you come from. Once you're here, you get involved in the knitting you become part of this lifestyle and community. I think the second part is experiencing crofting. And crofting is like farming, it's a Scottish word for farming. I think looking after sheep, understanding the process, having a relationship with the animals becomes really important. You start to understand a lot more about fibers and the quality, why our wool is the way it is and why it's considered so good and why it's so soft. The fleeces are packed oh, in bags and then it's sent out to the mill in Shetland. And some people send it to Jamie Smith. Me. You definitely need to be involved in, in the process of creating wool by learning to look after the animals properly. And then you will be clipping. So we do all the clipping of our fleeces. And I still like doing it the old way, by hand. And I think there is something nice about it about handling the animal and I have always explained that and I really enjoy doing it. We don't do the processing of the fleeces here, some people in the island do but I don't because it requires incredible skills, experience that I don't have and time. Uh, so if we're going to sell garments commercially 
I can't do the spinning of the wool. So we pack our fleeces and we send them in the Good Shepherd all the way to Shetland. It's because of them that we're able to offer people that amazing variety of colours to knit beautiful garments. So supporting them is really important. The person has the opportunity to choose colours, to choose patterns, to choose shape of the garment, the type of fitting, any neck details, cuff or waistband details, any shaping, special shaping in the garment, is all discussed with the customer. And then I go into producing swatches and for this I use a, a very basic computer program and it's great because it, it allows me to do loads of combinations and that's the front and that's the grey one which is this one here so you can see and I need I, this is where I do the design so I do just like a long thing like that and put all the patterns together and I do it in the computer because it allows me to make changes and see the overall design of the garment. They will either choose one or they will come back to me and say, right, can you change a pattern or I would like a different color. Once that's achieved and the customer is completely happy, I go into actually designing the garment, designing the shape of the garment, doing all the calculations with the measurements that they have sent to me. It's specifically for that body. We don't work with standard measurements. And then I start knitting the garment. So that can take anything between 18 to 20 hours, depending on how complex the color combinations are. Then after that, once I get the panels ready, then we go into hand finishing. Once that is finished, then the garment goes into washing and drying. And for drying, I use a woolly horse, which is a, a jumper board um, for... Some people use it to stretch the garments, but we actually use it to keep the shape. We take it off and we sew our labels and then our garment is wrapped up in tissue paper, put in a beautiful box with a postcard in and sent to you. As the plane took off and I looked down at the aisle, I was overcome with joy and an intense feeling of gratefulness for the opportunity that I was given and the amazing experience that it turned into. I'll never forget the fair aisle, but if I can leave you with just one thing, it's this. I would like to leave viewers with the idea that fair aisle is a wonderful place to live. <laughs> well, come and visit. <laughs> I mean, yeah, come and visit fair aisle. It's an amazing place. <laughs> We're in the middle of nowhere, but it's worth visiting. It's really a unique experience. Slow down in the background. One more I have to ask, can I get a free jumper? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but maybe, you never know. Maybe, yes. Yeah, so if you keep, well, we'll keep your details, Benjamin. You never know, a prototype might make your way. <laughs>